Okay, uh, I might start now so that we don't run out of time afterwards. Uh, again, uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar. In this webinar, we're going to be talking about some field trials that Behavior Works did uh, to measure what uh, messages work and which ones didn't. Um, they're really cool, really interesting to see. Um, our presenters are uh, Ryan Collins. Ryan is our head of Circular Economy Programs. Um, after nearly a decade of working in the banking and finance industry, Ryan was drawn to a career in environmental um, conservation that saw him work in Papua New Guinea in the Solomon Islands in Fiji, which is very, very cool. He has a background in psychology and environmental management. Uh, Ryan roles at Planet Arc since 2012 has been focusing on developing engaging and positive environmental behavior change programs to help everyone recycle and reduce waste. We also have Jenny. Um, most of you know her as Jenny Down, but now she is Jenny Macklin. Uh, she is a senior researcher at Behavior Works Australia with over 10 years experience in applied and behavior change and social research to develop effective policies and programs for household level industry and society wide change towards more circular futures. Jenny leads uh, much of Behavior Works research in consumption and waste. And she co-led the Waste and Circular Economy collaboration between Behavior Works and four state federal government partners. And it's currently leading the next major collaborative initiative on responsible consumption. So uh, welcome, uh, Ryan and Jenny. I'm going to mute myself now so you can actually listen to them. And Ryan will go ahead. Thanks very much, Ali. And thank you all for joining us today in the middle of National Recycling Week. Uh, I'm presenting to you today from uh, Dakinjung land, and I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to the elders past and present. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples here today. So yeah, so um, Planet Ark, for those um, who don't know us, um, uh, one of Australia's leading environmental behaviour change organisations. Um, and for now 30 years, this is our 30th birthday, um, we've been providing positive environmental actions for everyone. So that's from households, uh, for schools, uh, for businesses, government, local government um, and communities. Um, why do we do this? Well, we believe that the world must transition to a carbon neutral and circular economy, which I'm sure you can agree with. Um, our programs um, that we run, so they fall into a number of categories. We've got uh, sustainable resource use, um, for which National Recycling Week falls under. Um, some of our other programs there are recycling near you and business recycling. Um, we also have uh, the Australian Circular Economy Hub. Uh, so for those that want to join a, a um, information sharing networking uh, portal, um, look up Australian Circular Economy Hub. There's lots of uh, great experts uh, on the portal there. Um, of course, the Australasian Recycling Label and some product stewardship programs as well. Probably our most well-known um, program is National Tree Day. It's, it's Australia's biggest uh, nature caring event. Um, and then we've also got uh, carbon neutrality programs there and, and product endorsements as well. National Recycling Week, um, back when it started, uh, in 1996, it, uh, we had a recycling rate of about 7% nationally. Uh, now, as you probably are aware, it's up to 60%. So we have come a long way. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's, uh, you know, it's thanks to councils, it's thanks to householders, businesses, government, uh, recyclers um, that we've come this far. But obviously, we all know that there's more that can be done. Uh, the theme this year, waste isn't waste until it's wasted. Um, it's a great theme. Well, I think there's a tendency for um, for us to communicate as waste educators as much information as possible. So I think what the theme does this year is it helps to narrow the focus, um, making people sure that um, you know they're recycling what can be recycled, recycling, 
and taking a new perspective on on waste itself. Studies have shown that uh, having the knowledge uh, and ability and even the attention to recycle uh, doesn't necessarily mean that an in, in individual will recycle. Um, recycling is a, a low involvement decision. Um, it's uh, once someone has been educated, um, then it's, it becomes habit. So those habits that, they've, that have been learned and uh, inertia may actually block behavior change. Um, so yeah, the, the knowledge and ability in itself may not create uh, agency or motivation um, to change behavior um, it, when it comes to recycling. So before we get to the experiments, um, I just wanted to show a couple of examples where Planet Arc uses generic behavior change principles um, in some of our educational resources. Uh, now these haven't been tested in and of themselves, but you should see some linkages to some of the results um, of the experiments that Jenny will, will go through. Um, firstly, one key tool of behavior change is to value self-motivated change. Um, and this is related to creating a, a sense of agency or, or control. It's about feeling, you know, that you are able to do what, what you believe in. Um, so we have in uh so in terms of the messaging here we've got a, a thank you for recycling message which is you know a personalizing message it, it values people's roles we've also got a, a yes no yes we want you to keep it loose um in your recycling bin but no recycling bags uh recycling in bags um we we value loss much more than we value gains um for example you know losing 50 cents a day inspires action much more than gaining 50 cents a day. It's a classic case of FOMO or fear of missing out. Um, so some of our messaging is also um, revolved around loss aversion. Don't let your recycling go to waste. Um, and then again, there's that personalizing message there as well. Uh, we also use gamification. Um, you know, gamification can inspire joy and uh, positive emotions. Adding fun can obviously help with education. Um, so this is free to download should you wish to test your colleagues or family or um, residents. Um, I guess the main reason why Planet Arc was really keen to get involved and support these trials with Behaviour Works um, is that you know knowing what works means we're less likely to be wasting time and money on uh, less effective messaging. Uh, being able to apply more evidence-based um, and you know context-specific principles to our own messaging um, would you know help us and build on the behavior change principles that we're already using. Um, so now I'd like to hand it over to Jenny, who's going to take you through the experiments. Over to you, Jenny. Thanks, Brian and Ali. I'm really excited to be here today um, to share this work. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge um, that I'm joining from the lands of the Darawal speaking people uh, and acknowledge their, uh, pay my respect to their elders, um, past, present, and emerging, and to anyone in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander on the land today. So, yeah, this was the big program of work um, that Behaviour Works undertook. Um, and uh, one of the things I think around um, behavioural science is uh, that sadly there is like no magic pill from making this work for having you know the perfect thing to say or do that will get people to change their behaviour but what we um, try to do is, is bring a really systematic approach um, to the work that we do um, to really increase the odds that as um, Ryan said sorry I don't know what's going on with the screen um, but as Ryan said that all the effort um, and time and passion that's put into working with our community around recycling and waste avoidance and more broadly um, has a much greater chance of success of really landing with our target audience and um, with the community and seeing that change happen. So Behaviour Works, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we're a research centre at Monash University. Uh, I'm in Sydney working remotely um, down, for down in Melbourne. We run a series um, of behaviour science projects for a whole range of partners. Uh, we have ongoing research partnerships 
uh, with uh, particularly with some state and federal government agencies. And we uh, do a whole host of education and training from things like uh, these webinars to uh, sort of formal learning for those who want to get involved in behaviour change. And we work across a whole range of topics, including uh, waste and circular economy, which is my specialty. And um, part of the work that we do, as I said, is uh, in collaboration with our consortium partners, uh, including um, uh, the Department of um, the Victorian Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, Sustainability Victoria, New South Wales EPA, and the Federal Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water, um, along with the Shannon Company. Uh, who is a advertising communications um, company. And uh, being able to get these people together and actually leverage the combined value of resources is one of the things that BehaviourWorks is really excited about. And we um, understood um, a few years ago that uh, most of our partners were really concerned with um, a particular issue that was Australia was facing around our waste and recycling systems. And um, obviously, uh, you know, over time, seeing waste generation um, continue, continuing to increase, knowing that councils particularly, um, uh, you know, have a responsibility for helping households with their waste and, and for collecting and, and um, managing that waste, that recycling is one of the strongest ways that we have at the moment um, for managing that waste and that contamination is, is sort of a headache all across the country, um, despite all the effort um, and time that's given by councils to try and help our community um, to understand how the system works and how to use it. So what um, happened is that our partners decided to get together and to pool their resources um, to run a, a sort of a really major research program. Um, it had a number of uh, circular economy focuses, but also a, a clear program around our co-mingled curbside recycling um, contamination problem uh, with the idea of understanding the problem and then developing some trials to actually increase the amount of evidence we have, as Ryan said, about what actually works. So um, as part of this, uh, we reached out and partnered with a whole range of councils across New South Wales and, and Victoria, um, and along with support from Planet Arc to uh, run a series of online exper experiments and field trials. But we started off um, by doing some research, we actually reviewed the existing literature, uh, both what other researchers have come up with, um, material published by governments and councils. We spoke to our government partners and, and to their policy and programs people. And then we used that to develop some experiments to test online and then actual um, trials and actual programs out in the field with our council partners. And um, we learned along the way a few things about contamination. A lot of this won't be a surprise to those of you online who have been um, working in this space for some time. Um, but when we pulled it all, all together, it was really quite interesting to see that one of the things um, that we really needed to remember as we were going into this is that there are actually a lot of barriers to good recycling, to correct recycling. And they're not just around um, what people know, um, and uh, and whether they care about the environment. There's other things that are going on internally for people. There are broader social kind of influences, and there's also the physical context in which people are um, located when they're performing or, or perhaps not performing these behaviours. And so um, drawing on a whole lot of input from councils from previous um, workshops and um, research that had been done, we actually identified a whole range of things that are going on. I'm not going to go through these today um, because they are available online, but just to really highlight that this is complicated for people. Uh, you know, we think sometimes that, it, that recycling should be pretty simple. It's just knowing that these are the things that can go in and these are the things that can't. But when we dig down into it, there's actually a lot more going on for people. As Ryan said, habitual behaviour, low cognitive involvement behaviours can actually be quite hard um, for people to get right. So we did this research to understand what was going on and then what we really found um, talking to councils um, and, and people in industry is that the biggest issue that was coming out was not so much lack of knowledge but confusion and confusion coming from misinformation and conflicting um, information. So different uh, jurisdictions having different rules, you know, obviously different access to infrastructure and technology, um, different regulations across states. Uh, so people in neighbouring councils uh, being able to do different things, family and friends um, being advocates, but perhaps having outdated knowledge or, again, from, from different places, um, you know, the, all the symbols that uh, until recently have been proliferating packaging and, and confusing things, different language, uh, all sorts of things going on. 
and kind of leading to, um, you know, a, a couple of reactions with people who are refused and so they give up. They either just go with a, um, you know, put it in just in case mentality because they want to do the right thing or um, who think that they understand uh, how to recycle because they learned it at some point in their lives. Um, so they don't pay attention to the outgoing, the, the ongoing messages um, that are coming to them from their local counties from Canada and other sources. So then we went to see, you know, what evidence is there about what actually works to reduce contamination. And one of the things that we found was that there was not a lot of evidence at all about contamination. And interestingly, Australia's in a relatively unique place uh, globally in terms of how many people have access to curbside and how many people participate in curbside recycling. So a lot of the work overseas is actually around how do we get people to even try to recycle. But in Australia, wonderfully, uh, most households are engaged in recycling and we're really trying to optimise it to really increase that quality. So there was some evidence um, that particular approaches worked around making things easy, uh, making the context more conducive to what we want people to do, involving sort of social norms and modelling and, and persuasive messages that really tap into what people themselves care about um, rather than what you know, might be most important for us, us as environmental advocates or councils. And um, what we did was we then uh, realised that we really needed to test out some of these things. So we did a series of online um, experiments and trials, as I said, but they were born out of um, a couple of workshops that we held in Sydney and Melbourne uh, way back in November 2019, where we had over 70 representatives from councils across New South Wales and Victoria, the waste industry, Planet Arc, our government, our state and federal government partners. And we went through a whole range of things that councils are already doing now, ideas that people had um, been thinking about for a while, uh, the use of existing kind of um, generic behaviour change tools. And we came up with a few ideas. Um, some of these were around um, what actually works to grab people's attention, um, what helps to improve knowledge to overcome that confusion, and then what actually changes behaviour. So we ran um, Facebook uh, experiments testing different messages. We ran survey, uh, online survey kind of experiments testing different flyers. And then we actually, um, well, in fact, our council partners actually ran a series of programs um, with their community to trial um, changing context, changing in-home systems and providing feedback. So just a, a little um, preview of what that looks like. This is one of our Facebook um, experiments with Fairfield City Council just trying four different versions of a, a sort of a normal post that might encourage people to click through to the council website. Uh, we also uh, worked with councils to test a few different variations of their standard kind of recycling flyer to see if the way that we presented information and the types of information that we included were more likely to help people be able to select the correct items out of a list of things to go into recycling bin. We worked with councils that had a um, large uh, proportion of, of mugs or apartment buildings to actually trial um, very dedicated signage uh, and bin um, stickers in um, apartment building bin bays um, to say if we focused on um, a couple of things, so plastics and, and bag recycling, could we change that behaviour um, through kind of the physical context? We also um, worked with a few councils who were trialing one of the things that we know um, has, has uh, worked in some contexts around providing reusable bags um, to apartment buildings to help them stop collecting their recycling in, soft, in um, plastic bags. And we also worked with a few councils who, who tried a version of, of what we might colloquially call bin tagging. They're basically providing feedback to people on what they've actually put in the bin and how that relates to what we're hoping to see. And um, out of this, uh, we uh, learnt, um, as we know, that this sort of research is hard. It's hard to do. It requires a lot of investment um, from our council partners and, and more broadly. But we were really excited to find some key things that came out consistently. Um, one of the things that might be <laughs> a little bit disappointing, um, certainly our state government partners weren't so um, uh, excited to receive this message, is that we really do need to focus on uh, one particular thing at a time. So often um, in recycling, to make the most of recycling, we need to get as much recycling into the yellow bin as possible and all of that contamination out. But what we found was that when we actually tried to do both of these at the same time, contamination didn't improve. And it seems like um, people kind of have a bit of a rule of thumb that it's either put it in just in case or the planet art, you know, slogan, leave it out, if in doubt. And if what you're trying to do is reduce contamination, you really need to focus on 
contamination um, and really get that message in. And what we found um, interestingly was that the most effective way of doing that was focusing on the things that don't belong in the bin. So a lot of our recycling education does focus on, you know, the main things that we all know are recyclable around, you know, um, paper and plastic glass metal containers. Um, but highlighting that those are the only things that were recyclable was not nearly as effective as actually calling out all the things that shouldn't go in the recycling bin. So being clearer about the things we want out of the bin, more likely to get them out. We also found that trialing different messages to try and um, persuade or motivate um, people to uh, pay more attention to what they're recycling, to try and recycle correctly, um, can actually backfire. So really underscore the need to really test out and develop that evidence around what types of messages really, um, really work. So we found that uh, some of these messages around, you know, the fact that the system is changing and it matters what you put in your recycling bin, or the fact that we need to get the amount of what's in the bin recycled higher actually increased contamination. And uh, our speculation around this is because, again, they, they emphasize that idea that we need to recycle um, a lot. And so that idea about we better put it in just in case. But some of our other messages um, really showed some really real promise in our online experiments. So noting that as an experiment, it's kind of a bit hypothetical. People aren't actually standing in front of their bin doing it. They're just telling us you know, what they would do. But some of the messages around actually prompting re reflection, getting people to think about what they do first so they go into that moment and then giving them the information that they need um, seems to land a little bit better. Um, talking about the consequences, um, whether that's actual uh, literal consequences like bin rejections, um, but also just the, the broader term consequences about the impacts when this isn't right. Um, some of these really helped, uh, you know, make it more salient for people that they needed to pay attention and um, try and get the right things in the bin. And uh, finally, um, sorry, um, one of the things that we did find, and this is a, a common um, finding in research on behaviour change across the board, not just in waste, but a sort of the, the basic approach of education and information provision is generally not sufficient to see the behaviour change um, that we want um, at the scale that we want. So obviously a certain amount of um, information is always necessary in this case when people need to know what can and can't go in the bin, but just focusing on those kind of informational or instructive messages aren't enough to um, motivate people, and particularly when they're static signage, um, obviously just doesn't land enough for people in their busy days with their own kind of shopping list of priorities. But what we did find, um, and this is really um, validating what a lot of councils have started to move towards, is that providing personalised feedback does reduce contamination. So we worked with a number of councils uh, who tried this in a number of different parts of their areas around actually doing the visual inspection, looking for evidence of what was in the bin and feeding back to, council, to residents about that. So um, out of all of this, there's a few things that we pulled um, out that we think is really important when you guys are doing, um, for those of you who do waste education, and the first thing is to be really targeted about what you want to achieve. And this is just an example of one behaviour, which was our using the reusable bag um, to collect uh, recycling. These bubbles are all of the different things that people need to do just to switch to using a reusable bag um, to collect their recycling. And so that's why focusing on just contamination um, and not sort of leakage or, or quantity, but also being really specific about the type of contamination. Is it soft plastic? Is it uh, bad materials? Is it um, you know broken crockery and glassware? What is it that you really need to get out of the bin and being very targeted on that? The second thing was to then understand the specific issue. Why is that particular thing um, going in the bin? Because what we found is there's some general drivers of contaminating behaviour, people not paying attention, for example, thinking they already know what the rules are and, and sort of not updating their knowledge. But individual contaminants have their own drivers. So, for example, the reason why people bag recycle, recycling um, in soft plastic bags can be around beliefs about what happens. It can be attitudes to kind of the messiness of yuck. It can just be habit. Even if they know they shouldn't do it, they're just so used to doing it and physical barriers. So getting down to that specific level of understanding why it's happening in your community. And then matching your approach to those barriers. So if it is an incorrect belief about what happens, um, then you can use education and information to correct that belief. 
But if they have concerns about things, you really need to speak to those, um, you know, those concerns and those motivations. And if it's physical challenges or perhaps, um, you, you know, competing priorities, you need to make it really easy for people to do the behaviour. And then finally, because as we, we found, um, sometimes our best intentioned um, efforts informed by theory and by past research can actually backfire wherever you can, um, testing messages before you roll them out. If that's in you know, a Facebook experiment or a trial like we um, undertook with some of our partners, that's fabulous. But it can be as simple as actually just floating the message with a few people in a focus group or just a conversation that you're having with your community to see how they understand the messages and what it means for them when they receive them. So thanks um, to Planet Arc for being able to share this um, and all of our research is available on the Behaviour Works website. Okay, so the resources are available um, on the Planet Arc uh, National Recycling Week website. Um, so they're the trials that, that were on printed or, or um, you know, bin stickers, uh, cards, those, those sorts of materials. Um, they're all on the website at, at the moment. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's the website. Um, the link is on the NRW page. There we go. Thank you all. Um, I'll, I'll hand it over to Ali, I think um to see if there's any questions do you have any questions for either uh jenny or brian uh, please just put them in the chat box and we can there's my oh my thanks well i can read out the first one um ali uh it's for both of us jen um so this is from Gekka. Uh, the environment sector is both rewarding and challenging. I'd love to know if the presenters have any tips on keeping energised while working on sustainability behaviour change. Um, so I think for me, it's about uh, celebrating the achievements wherever we can. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> talking about how much we've achieved um, in terms of you know how much has been recycled, how much has been kept out of landfill and um not uh littered in the, in the environment um is always a positive um any you know increases in in use of different recycling systems etc um we're all on a journey and and people are on different stages of that journey um so yeah that that would be my tip um jen yeah, I think um, for me, and I don't know if it sounds motivating when I say it in my head, but I um, I guess I just expect that it's it's really hard. And so what that means is that every little win um, becomes a big win because uh, the challenge is, is quite enormous. And so uh, by just accepting that and saying, yes, it's going to be hard, there's going to be problems, there's going to be challenges, uh, to then say, well, what little thing can I do now to make things better? And, you know, keep focusing on that. What's the next thing I can do? What's the next impact that I can have? Um, for me is is what, um, yeah, drives me. And, and and those little examples are everywhere. And I just, you know, hope and, and, and kind of have faith that they will add up to big changes as history has shown us um, happen. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, I have another question from Paul. Um, Jenny, any thoughts on the differences between talking about materials going into bins, example, plastic, life, organics, paper, et cetera, or taken in terms of products like packaging? Um, yeah, this is a really great question. Uh, we had hoped to actually answer this very directly, um, but unfortunately, it was one of the ones that uh, experiments that didn't come off due to, to COVID <laughs> impacts. But one of the things we found in our earlier research was that some of the confusion um, comes around material-based messaging. And so people put a lot of materials in their bin that are paper um, because paper is recyclable as a message. But you know, things like tissues and, and serviettes, uh, certain types of wax paper are all paper, but they're not recyclable. Um, similarly with glass, um, we, we find that people know that glass is recyclable and therefore they put plate glass or broken glass, uh, broken glassware in. So we definitely found that that focusing on uh, what we definitely heard was that focusing on particular types of products really makes a difference. So, you know, one of the things that we did try was saying things like um, plastic, glass and metal containers, you know, for example, so highlighting the, the material but focusing on the item. And we definitely think that that sort of um, specific 
item um, thing is actually going to be better in the long run, even if it does mean a longer list. Um, but you know, when we tested the the the, the flyer that I showed up that, that had the best um, response to it from contamination listed the very specific items that can't go in the red bin, and that was what landed. So I think um, sometimes to try and make it easy, maybe we oversimplify, and then people uh, even further simplify those messages when actually we know that recycling um, correctly is a little bit nuanced. Thank you. Um, we got another question here. Uh, what is a good amount of time for a Facebook trial? Yeah, this is a, a great question. I'm really glad that people are interested because in one sense, um, Facebook trials are actually really quite simple to set up. If you've already got um, Facebook, which most councils do, and you're already using the kind of um, the, the promotion, the advertisement tools that Facebook gives you, um, they have the tools built in um, to their platform to actually test different messages. For our messages, we actually ran them um, for two weeks uh, just because we wanted to really make sure that across okay. all of our councils who are all testing different things um, in their own audiences, that we would get enough responses to be able to run our analysis because we use statistics um, to, to really have that confidence. Um, but really, uh, you know, it depends on how many people do react and respond um, to your messages when you put them out there. But they can be as quick as, uh, you know, coming up with a few messages um, that you like, loading them into the thing, running them for a week or two, and Facebook gives you all of the information back to tell you which ones actually work better. So definitely something I would encourage. And we have um, some guidelines that we gave our um, council partners that we'd definitely be happy to share um, those guidelines and our experiences in running them if there are councils who are keen to try these things themselves. Yep, I'll have another question. And then uh, we have a few questions about red cycle. So we will touch on those in a second. Um, but for um, the purpose of this webinar, because we're talking about behavior change and the trials, uh, we do have another question on that for you, uh, Jenny. If you don't have a budget for bin inspections to provide personalized feedback on contamination, et cetera, uh, what's your recommendation for providing education to residents on a broad scale example, newspaper advertising or social media? Um, I think you can still personalize uh, or, or make messages feel personal, but perhaps at that slightly broader scale. So uh, even if you can't look in your individual bins, you can still be understanding what's going on in the community, what are the most common types of um, contaminant materials. And I think feeding that back in a personalized way, like you know, we're noticing our households are putting these things in the bin um, or when, you know, when we don't want to be disingenuous, but, you know, trying to craft that message that, that sounds personalised, that, you know, these are the things we're finding in the waste um, and listing them off. Um, it means that people can recognise for themselves, oh, that's something I put in um, the bin. It was actually some um, uh, research that was done by Ipsos, the New South Wales EPA, um, quite a few years ago now that I pull out um, from time to time where, you know, they they actually found that listing specific items um, that are commonly contaminated, uh, the people respond to that if they see those things um, in your communications that they know they do. So you can definitely have communal um, feedback uh, if you can't be looking at individual households. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, to talk about the elephant in the room, um, just a little bit about the soft plastic. There's quite a few uh, comments here, but I think there's two um, uh, questions in general, like what is like what's currently happening with recycle, what's happening, and we all know that they have ceased uh, collections for soft plastics at the moment, which is very unfortunate. I think we are all very uh, devastated. Um, there are a few questions in here around how is that going to impact a trust in the system and how I mean, this is meant to be a temporary situation. So once it comes back, how is that going to affect uh, communications and behavior change for people to go back and do the right thing? Um, it's obviously not going to be great for trust. Um, you know, we've we've all uh, been through the uh, China sword um, crisis. Um, there was, you know, um, tons of uh, negative media about what was happening to recycling. Um, which, you know, it was good that recycling was a mainstream topic. Uh, but yeah, there was obviously that loss of trust and um, it's harder to, or it takes longer to build trust than it does to lose it. Um, so wh whatever we as waste educators can do to uh, keep that trust is important. Um, how we can do that is, is again, you know, um, 
celebrating the fact that you know 5.4 billion pieces of soft plastics um, were saved from through red cycle for uh, from entering our landfills and and natural environments. So you know that, that that's that's a huge win. Um, uh, hopefully, it's it's a temporary problem at the moment. Um, and you know, Red Cycle and and other stakeholders are are looking at solutions um, to get that uh, you know get those solutions online as as quickly as possible. Um, I guess what we also need to do is uh, put some context around the amount of waste that uh, soft plastic is. Um, ninety seven percent of the waste that Australia generates is not plastic. That's ninety seven percent. Of course, we don't want soft plastics entering uh, the marine environments, um, but um, you know it's National Recycling Week, and it's still a whole lot of materials that we, uh, you know, need to think about in terms of reducing the amount that we use and also recycling. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the main message is that uh, to encourage or to um, ensure that residents aren't wish cycling those soft plastics in in the curbside recycling bin um and you know reducing and, and reusing using reusables uh to replace like produce bags uh sorry re, uh reusable produce bags that people can take to to the shops to uh, use instead of other um the supplied soft plastics is is one um kind of action that people can take um yeah um hand it over to jen Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I think the, um, one of the disappointing things about this um, development is not so much that it happened, that that's disappointing, but actually the media coverage um, has been really quick to sensationalise and to point fingers. And um, it's it's kind of hard to get messages out into the community um, at the same scale that the media can. But I think um, just in the individual conversations I've been having um, already today uh, online and, and with people as Ryan said, you know, put in some of the context around it, um, that actually in one sense, you know, the, the problem that um, Red Cycle is facing is actually the same problem that we did face with, with China Thought, and that is that we focus a lot on sorting and collection of recyclables, and in Australia, our reprocessing um, and buying back of the recycled products is, is pretty small. We've got, you know, um, the governments have, have since China um, sort of, you know, put in place um, processes to try and help develop our industries to do that. But Red Cycle was just one player who um, did a massive, major achievement of developing a national collection network, but they were still dependent on someone to take that material and then um, turn it into to, you know, new products. And those partners were then dependent on other people to buy them. And so this idea about you know, the, the need for demand um, for recycled content and buying back, that's been the problem that we've been facing over the last four years, and that's the problem in this situation. So it, it, I don't know the answer for how to cut through with your community the concern and the disappointment um, that's being experienced, but trying to acknowledge um, that, you know, and, and point out that, you know, this is a temporary problem that Red Cycle is working to fix. Um, it is perhaps a reminder that our system isn't there yet because we are still focused on collection a lot. Um, and we need more kind of um, resources. Um, but this sort of transition from collecting and sending, you know, sending away our materials to be used elsewhere versus uh, actually trying to recycle them, you know, in Australia, this is a long-term change. And I think perhaps um, we may have all done ourselves a bit of a disservice by, by making um, recycling seem so easy for households for so many years when in fact it's actually quite complicated. And um, individually, I think people recognise that, but how to get that message out collectively, um, I think, as Ryan said, is a challenge because, you know, some people did have um, their trust kind of, you know, um, overturned initially a few years ago and to have these series of crises um, as the media is styling them um, is difficult. So how, however we can just get that message out to counter that negativity and to put it into context. I think um, when we can reach people, those messages work. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, the best we can um, the best we can try for at the moment. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so that's that's the current uh, situation. I, I know there's a lot more um, information around this, and I'm pretty sure we will be listening to more 
uh, news as time passes by. But um, speak, Jenny, you mentioned uh, that is, or Ryan, I can't remember who it was, that it's very important at the moment to, um, that people don't put their soft plastics in their recycling bin. Um, so that leads me to the next question. And I think we have uh, time for another two questions um, for you, Jenny, from uh, Simon Crawford. So uh, to make it easier uh, for our bin inspectors, we have positive response for people doing the right thing on one side of our bin tax and then the negative response on the other side for people contaminating the bins. Do you think we need to have separate tax? Look, in our trials, we did have separate materials. Um, part of the reason was that we wanted to be able to really tailor um, the messages. And so we actually used a, a range of things. We actually had a postcard that had either a corrective um, response or a reinforcing response and then a um, follow-up postcard or, or bin tag that had the same message. Um, at, but we didn't trial it. We didn't compare that to ones that had either side. I think the main thing would be how confident you are that um, your household is getting the right message, the message that you want. So I've seen a number of people who have the bin tags that sort of fold around so that there's clearly one message that's on the outside um, and it's clear which message you want them to read. Um, so I think, uh, again, as I said, um, you know, ways of testing this, um, you could probably have some conversations with people to make sure that they are getting the message that you want. Um, I, I think it's probably um, safer to have separate um, tags, but I don't necessarily think it's, um, it, it would necessarily be necessary. Um, we didn't we didn't test that. Um, so and, and, and obviously the, the resource use that's involved in having to separate um, stocks of materials um, is something we want to avoid where possible. So I don't have a, a strong answer for you, um, but I, I really focus on uh, just confirming that people are getting the message they want, uh, that you want them to get. Thank you. And last question uh, for, by the way, for anyone who we didn't answer a question, um, we are going to have an FAQ document that we will be circulating after this session. So uh, the last question is, um, have you found that different councils, because you mentioned confusion uh, at the beginning of your presentation, Jenny. So have you found that uh, different councils and states having different recycling rules to be one of the biggest issues in creating confusion? Yeah, so it, it definitely came up strongly in the initial research that we did, um, both um, from the perspective of uh, people moving um, from different areas, from an area where the rules were one way to another area, um, and uh, people broadcasting or communicating um, the rules that then get picked up by the net. And so uh, someone in New South Wales can actually read the rules from WA and vice versa. And finally, from our well-meaning and pension family and friends who, who have, you know, researched the rules in their particular council and not realising that they're not universal. And so advocating them to people in different areas. So definitely the lack of consistency um, has created confusion. And we've seen, for example, you know, a, a few states, WA um, initially and uh, uh, Victoria now moving to those uh, standardised lists. And one of the things that that does um, is, is really make the message cut through. So you cut out some of the confusion and some of the competing information. Um, it is really challenging to have consistency. I'm not going to um, deny that in any way to, to get processes um, and facilities all across an entire region, you know, to be all able to process the same materials and accept the same things. It does mean sometimes that some things end up on the no list, even though some people could recycle it. So there, there is challenges involved in getting that harmonization, but where it's possible or, or where we can move towards it, um, definitely the feedback has been that uh, it makes communicating the message easier and it would certainly remove some of those barriers that we're hearing about. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, uh, uh, I, I, th I saw there's a question there about the statistic. Um, that's from the National Waste Report, but um, yeah, we'll, we can provide a link to that in the Q&A um, that goes out. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you everyone for attending uh, today's webinar. It's very interesting information that we can all use as waste educators. Um, so yeah, I will let you go back to your busy lives and uh, yeah, as mentioned, we will be circulating all of these materials again. We have shared the link to where all of the um, like positive or like the assets that work uh, positively work on the Planet Arc website. So just share that and I will also be sharing that uh, through that Q&A uh, document. Um, happy National Recycling Week, everyone. <laughs>